This is the thing that everyone wants to know. And the way I want to frame this, again, just because we are reaching that holiday season into the semester, what I like to kind of stress is, you know, you're going to be going and talking to your friends and family and parents and, you know, whatnot. Welcome to being the expert in the thing everyone has an opinion on. You like it. You hate it. It's the devil. It's the next revolution. It's going to make us obsolete or it's going to be our servants. I don't really care where you, you fit in that category. But the part that you want to really understand is you understand it. You get it. You understand that it's a math equation at the end of the day and it's the decisions. And we'll talk much more on that uh, in our ethics lecture you know, next week. But uh, again, this is that kind of this is the, the culmination. This is essentially that, 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 that brass ring that we have worked towards that has made all the headlines for literally, I mean, the past decade, but like two weeks, you know, two years ago, something called ChatGPT rolled in and it upended all of our lives, right? Again, so we do want to talk about it. And what is this whole process? So, you know, again, I can't give you everything. I only got 75 minutes with you uh, trying to help cover everything in AI, but there are some terminologies that are going to be super important should you choose to go down this route. We've already kind of seen this. If you remember from the principal component analysis lecture, that was something that we were doing. We were taking the results, the training, the numbers that we we learned about in PCA, and we showed, hey, you know, we can make estimations. We can make, you know, we can take those numbers and maybe do some scalar multiplications to generate them. And so what you start to see in this land is we're doing a whole bunch of matrix multiplications, matrix additions, matrix manipulations. And so that's where there is some terminology that starts to come into place, right? We have obviously the scalar. It's one number, right? But then we start getting into that notion of the vector, right? The vector is meant to essentially be just our array, right? The only difference is rather than it being an array sort of in this direction, because that's programming, right? It's an array in this direction, because that's math. And there's a difference between the two of those, right? But that's where, hey, the multidimensional array starts to come into play, right? That's where in math they refer to it as the matrix. But what happens if I have a multidimensional multi-dimensional array, right? A, you know, a, a, another layer into the whole thing. And congratulations, now you know where the term tensor comes into play. It's just sort of adding in, hey, we have these layers of, or so we have these matrices of numbers. Now we have a bunch of those matrices lined up, stacked on top of each other, right? In a nutshell, when we start kind of using the terminology of a tensor, all of these get referred to as a tensor. They're all technically a tensor, right? Rank zero tensor, rank one tensor, rank two, rank three. We can keep on going. Rank four tensor, right? I could probably add another one. I just don't really have a way to visualize that. In a, a, someone, again, figure out how to visualize the fifth dimension for me. I'm waiting, right? So again, or the sixth, my point being is, you know, that's all that term kind of comes in. Because I know when I started out, like tensor was not a term. And I, then I saw it everywhere. And I was like, why, what's a, what's a tensor, right? It's just matrix arrays, right, in our world of computer science. But why that matters is because now we start looking at, well, how are we creating these tensors? How are we manipulating these tensors? How are we working with our arrays? And so, uh, you know, if we're looking at two separate vectors, I made two, a V and a W, right? Let's say I want to make a different vector, whatever that, you know, again, I want to make one kind of vector going on here. Uh, okay, well, what can I do? That's, that's the sort of question. It's not necessarily how do I do it, but what is at my disposal of like things that I could do to create this third vector from these two vectors. 
And the first one that we have is the direct sum style option, right? And what this is going to do, contrary to the name, it is not going to try and sum them together, right? There are two, you know, uneven uh, tensors going on here, right? You can't add, right? How do you do it? But what direct sum is meant to do is it's essentially a concatenation or a combination, right? You see, hey, there's my first vector merged, right? We just added to it. So that's, again, direct sum. But then we also have the tensor product. And this is where the power starts to come into play, right? We are going to take suddenly our vector. And we are going to, again, take some form of a product with it. But how that operates is in our case, right, matrix multiplication. We're just going through and combining, or combining, right? I'm doing a multiplication across all of my vectors or all of the values inside of my vectors, and that's going to then produce some new vector. Okay? So like we, you see both of the ways, and they're not mind-blowing. I will tell you, you don't have to, you know, worry about making these in, for an exam because we're doing a product uh, across. Again, this is the, all of these get referred to as tensors. And we're doing a product. Yeah. D don't ask me why we call this one direct stump. So that part I got to, I can look it up for you. Is the answer there? Um, but the reason why I kind of throw those two pieces out there is they start to allow us to have a lot of power. Because remember, at the end of the day, we're still dealing with the idea of a matrix. Not a matrix. Um, a neural network, right? We are still in sort of this space where I have a neuron that is being fed some inputs with some weights to them. But the problem is, it's no longer just one perceptron. It is multiple perceptrons coming into play. So this, you know, if this was x1, x2, x3, it's no longer just x3 or x1, x2. It's sort of x1 of the first layer, x2 of the first layer, x3 of the first layer. And suddenly, this becomes x1, or the input, of the second layer, right? That starts to be where we come in. And why I present that is now we are taking a little bit of, I'll call it a history lesson, a trip back in time. But how I kind of really frame it is these were the standards we were making to show how good a model was. And so the CIFAR uh, data set, right? This data set, now kind of old, uh, but if you went in, right, here it is, ta-da. It is, in essence, uh, how, how many minutes was it is? There are 60,000 images, a 32 by 32 pixeled RBG image. So 32 by 32 is some number right off the top of my head. And then we've got three, you know, an R, G, and B value to each one of those. But at the end of the day, again, it's 60,000, and they all have a label attached to it, whether they're a dog, a deer, uh, a cat, a horse, an automobile, right? And so, okay, well, again, think about that. I have a fixed size for each one of these images. I have, again, 32 times 32 times 3 number of inputs going in, can you build an AI agent that can accurately predict when it sees a deer, right? Or, that's, I, I think that's a bird, that's an ostrich, uh, or a horse, right? Can you make these predictions? And so again, this became sort of a very big uh, uh, checkpoint for any algorithm that you were attempting to work on and test because, again, right, it's a big data set. It, ha it already has the labels, right? That's actually the hardest part of the whole process. So uh, now it's just a matter of 
fine-tuning your design, fine-tuning this topography, like where does this connect to kind of things. All of those little bits start to come into play. And so again, as we start to look at it, right, why I present it is also it lets us see this idea of imagery as an input. One of the things that I'm, I'm stressing oftentimes in sort of my classes is the shape of data, right? There's numbers, but then there's images. Images, right, just like you've all started to learn and play around with, they're just RBG values combined together. Literally, I just because I'm about to teach my light theory class uh, in 116, I literally have lights that I'm going to start, you know, because lights, right? When you combine lights together, they produce new colors. And that's where these RGB values come into play. And so, again, numbers, fine. Can I make other things numbers? And yeah, you know, every single one of those RB, RGB values, those correspond to, wouldn't you know it, an array. Look at that. That's just a two-dimensional array of just numbers. What number? The red value in the RBG channel. The green value in the RGB channel. The blue value in the RGB channel. And again, all of those just produce some value that I can work from. Now, herein lies why this was such a challenging task, right? It, it wasn't immediately solved, uh, but here's why it became just a, a, a worthwhile kind of a, a stepping stone in our world. Because specifically, think about what I showed you, right? Uh, I take all my inputs and they all have their own weights. Well, okay, if I just did one perceptron, probably wouldn't do that well. And then there's the, you know, the whole, we could add and make these more. But what happens if I had done something like, oh, let me add 10 hidden layers to this, right? So this fed in somewhere, and I want to find a pattern of the horse, and I want to find a pattern of the, the automobile and the bird and all that stuff, right? I make 10 hidden layers for that or something, whatever, right? Well, think about what that means from a hardware perspective. That becomes each one of my inputs or something like that. If I'm needing 30,000 dimensional inputs or weights just to handle the original you know, section, right? 32 by 32 by three, right? That's gonna give you about 3,000. Well, if I have now 10 hidden layers that all need 3,000 connections, I've suddenly turned this into 30,000 or more weights. And that, again, that doesn't seem like much, but when you're doing a lot of training and calculations and you're you know, running through 60,000 images to build a model that can then deduce this stuff, right? all of those little details start to add up and they take time and that becomes a problem is why I'm kind of stressing that. So that's why we pivoted. It's not, well, pivoted. It's not that the neural network is bad. It's that just continuing to use the neural network as is, is the limitation. Again, that's where the AI winter came from, was this idea that, hey, you know, as these things grow bigger, it gets harder to train them, it gets slower, the accuracy gets pretty bad. So what can we do to resolve this? And that is where we introduced the convolution neural network. The CNN came in. And so the entire idea to the convolutional neural network is rather than looking at the input as a whole, let's use a sliding window. And I notice I said input as a whole because you can use a CNN outside of text or outside of pictures. Pictures are just the best way that we could figure out to represent that to the world, right? So again, suddenly I have this little tiny window. If I have a 32 by 32 bit image, what if I only looked at an eight by eight slice or window to work from? And then, okay, as I'm working through that, again, I say it's a sliding, ugh, sliding window. Sliding window. 
Okay, so again, what did that do? Well, that just turned my 32 by 32 image into an 8 by 8 little snippet of the image. And then what? Well, again, right, what can I do with that? This is where what started to occur is a little bit of what we would call downscaling. And if you've messed around with any form of image processing for a little bit, right, Think about what the average, to make a grayscale image, right? You add the RGBs, you divide by three. If you want to do something like blur, you look around your neighbors, add them together, and then divide by however many things you added. So again, what we're doing is we're scaling this downward because again, as we deal with images, we're looking for these types of compression algorithms, right? So we take maybe this sliding window, right? We take that. And then suddenly, all right, well, it's no longer the 32 by 32. It suddenly just becomes 8 by 8. Now, yes, it's still 8 by 8 with your three, you know, color channels as well. But you notice it's a much smaller one. And specifically, what I can do with this is I can scale this down by taking that whole image. Again, I took my, eight, uh, my 32 by 32 image. I looked at only a small fragment of that image. And then what am I going to do? I'm taking that fragment and I'm shrinking it down into a five by five tensor, right? I don't want to say image in this case because we're now just dealing with math. Those are all weights going in, right? These are all just input. And so this just becomes some little tiny matrix worth of numbers. Good so far questions on the tiny matrix of numbers. So would the kernel be the input into the neural network? So we are already in the neural network. So it's not that the kernel is the input to the neural network. We're already inside of the neural network. The image here is still the original part of it, but now what is occurring is this is no longer just like a single amorphous biological black box. It's their steps. They're essentially, algorithms are now being applied and control structures are being applied now. So, hmm? Would it be like there's the first that, like, there's all the pixels in the image, like all the color channels, and all the inputs, and then it goes into a hidden layer that is those kernels. Yes and no. So again, I'll show a little bit more in detail. Like I'll show how we solved the CFAR or like the first attempt at the CFAR a little later, and you'll see it's like you're you're. It's oftentimes what you end up doing is you take sort of these portions, and now that I have this set of values, I would then feed this into potentially another separate neural network altogether. And that, that's where we start getting into that whole like multi-layer concept. Um, but again, what happens as we start to kind of build off of the CNN is, all right, well, again, it's a sliding window. How do you slide? Right? Do I slide to the left? Do I slide... To the right, bam, no, my goodness. Thank you for at least entertaining. My point being is specifically as we're sliding through this, how do we slide? And specifically like what happens when we slide our little yellow box out here, right? What happens if the yellow box was right here? So you can see that this is all being handled, right? That, or not handled, but that's also being fed into the, the, uh, the, the model. And remember, right, what, like one, that's index out of bounds for us coders. What, what number do I put there, right? That, that also starts to matter because it's a bounding box. Do I, you know? And so that becomes these terms, the padding, the stride, and the dilation. So, each one of those, right, has their own terminology. Padding, again, right, as I start looking at that image, 
Here's that image again, right? This, is, this portion of that window is being addressed in padding. It's this idea of like, oh, okay, well, if you're outside the normal range, what number do you give it, right? Okay, well, you can see if you just do a zero padding, that means you're just saying, oh, if I do run into, if I do have my sliding window stepping out of the bounds, we will give it a zero, right? That, that's all, you could give it a one. You could give it 10 billion. Don't give it 10 billion, but right, it's just we're saying what those values are. Then we've got the stride. Again, you notice when I made the animation, it was just a sliding window happened, right? So the question becomes, all right, if I'm about to do my next one, how far do I step? And that also includes downward. It's not just a sliding across, but like as I get to maybe the end of the line and I need to go down, that's also part of the stride, right? So if I did something like a stride one, I'm just saying, hey, you move literally one pixel at a time. Uh, and then we've got the dilation. And specifically the way I want you to think about this is sometimes you just like, you, you don't want the exact thing. And what I mean by that is specifically you're, you essentially just add a little noise into this, add a little static into the whole process. That way you're not training explicitly. This is a, to attempt to block out your overflows. You don't explicitly train on everything. You, you kind of, hey, here's a little layer that we're going to pull it on top, and we're going to hide some stuff. We're going to hide, you know, I'm just arbitrarily picking 10, 000, you know, 10%, but like of my window, right, let's arbitrarily pick 10 pixels to zero out. So like that one, that one, that one that one, and for good measure, that one, right? It's just those, don't, those didn't get passed in. They're zeros now, right? Again, the whole purpose is just to help make these general models that can identify the pattern, but not explicitly the picture of this plane uh, as we go through this. So as we continue to do this, just to really stress this, uh, one thing that this, yes, so the question is, would you apply the dilation before or after the screening? The same, the same 10 pixels. This is where you're going to hate me. I, I get you. This is where you're going to hate me. You try them both. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Like, again, when we're, when we're dealing with, like, this whole... Topologic, uh, topology. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but like when I show you the the version that did work, you're gonna notice that like it's, oh, how did how did that happen? It is, and yeah, it's a lot of each little of each piece that I'm showing you today becomes its own building block of your topology. Uh, just uh, there, I, I will no discard just to give you the sneak peek of it, that way you can think about it. Where are you? This is uh, a version that solved CIFAR. So again, here's your image. What did you produce? A bunch of those ReLU 24 bits. Um, then we get into pooling, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then we get into the softmax. How did they decide this? Was there any rule for it? You just kind of built into it, yeah. I would call that something that you should reach out to a professor and say, I want to study. Yes, even I'm thinking that might be good for like attention, right? Because PCA is meant to show where the highest variances are. Well, an attention matrix is kind of doing that same thing. So yeah, study it. <laughs> Write a paper. I want to be co-author. Uh, anyways, let me get back to this. Uh, where are we? I was right here. Uh, so just to tie it in, this is where we get this delicate balance or like the intersection to a lot of different computer science topics. Again, we're dealing with images. 
Well, images also leads into a land known as signal processing and image processing, right? Well, because it's numbers, and it's numbers in a sequence uh, that's happening. And so there were terminologies that are also being applied from that land, uh, and they mean the same thing, but they have slight differences, right? The reason why we were talking about uh, padding, well, that's also what uh, image processing starts to refer to as their kernel. And when we start talking about the stride, that's what they start talking about as their mask. And what we were talking as dilation, that's what they start talking about as their filter. Same term, same gist of what it's meant to do, different area with different names for it is the best way I, I want you to think about it, right? Um, but either way, the bigger uh, important thing is like, here are these tools that you can now fiddle with in your topology as you work through them. So <clears throat> why, again, I stress this is, again, when it first came out, when uh, we were first starting to work off of it, again, the convolutional behavior network. Uh, so again, we got to go 2010. I was a grad student for the first time in 2010, right? That's, we were just starting to see that the CNN could do good things. But notice again, this is as I've talked about like how the history of like this stuff wasn't as powerful, right? Look at the accuracy, right? When we were, you know, again, 14 years ago, we only had an 80% accuracy on guessing these pictures, 32-bit pictures, right? This was incredibly difficult. And in fact, that sort of set the standard of now like, okay, the state of art in neural network research is 80%. Can you get better? Well, then, yes, uh, max out networks. I, don't, I came out three years later and was like, yeah, we can make it 90% accuracy. And again, that's, okay, all right, can we get better? Because it's only 32 pixels and internet of things and stuff is all that. And so you can start to see that's essentially what has transpired over the last, you know, again, over a 10-year cycle. We went from having 80% accuracy to essentially 100% accuracy, right? Now, you know, we have methods for just doing this and it works like that, but we're not there, right? Or we're at the beginning where we still have to hit convolutional deep belief networks before we can understand any, like, what the hell's a shakedown, right? I know what a shakedown is, but I don't know what a math shakedown is. Those are different things. My point being, right, each one of those was a small incremental improvement that took 10 years worth of time to get there. Really kind of puts in perspective where ChatGPTs and LLMs are now. We complain about them and how they're, you know, they can't solve things. We're two years in and it's already performing better in math than humans. Where is it gonna be in eight more years, right? 10 more years. Kind of exciting, in my opinion. Terrifying, but exciting. My point being, I showed you how we did downscaling, right? We were shrinking these things down. But one of these approaches, why we were talking about it and why it has such a kind of deep history with image processing is, well, if I can shrink an image down to recognize it, can I recreate the image? Right? From that five by five little kernel, can I make it bigger? Can I reconstruct the image in some way? Can I upscale? And you have started to see, you know, these are now like commonplace where someone will take something from either the 80s or 90s, uh, uh, some cartoon or video, and then upscale it, right, to 4K resolution. And what they're essentially doing is they are applying this approach. Given some small input, can I have it run through a model that now it's predicting things that weren't originally there, right? That are essentially trying to make some guess between its neighbors. And that's where this upscaling came into play. And so that's where we do kind of come in and see from the very beginning. It's not just that we immediately went to 4K, but hey, you know, this is Pixel CNN by Google. If I were to give you 
I have a ground truth. Let's say I have a 32 by 32 pixeled face. I know that it looks pixelated. Yes. Again, you work with more, you know, you don't work with real images because real images break everything. It's not that it's bad. It's just the, the math's harder, right? So again, well, we start with, okay, well, if that's a 32 by 32 bit pixel or a pixeled image, can I give you an 8 by 8 image? Again, 32 by 32, that's, right, that's a thousand something, uh, uh, 1024, I think. Um, right? Can I give you 64 numbers, 64 times three numbers? And what can you, can you, how close can you get to recreating this? And wouldn't you know it, look at that. Those are eerily similar, right? Those are actually doing a pretty good job of being able to make some guesstimation. Are they perfect? No. As, you know, when I was up close, they looked similar, but as I get a little further away, they're not 100% there. But again, we're starting to generate data from these models. And just because it wasn't there immediately, that just meant, oh, we need to train more. We need to rethink how we're training these models and the topography of what I'm doing here, right? Another one that's really important, and this is starting to like push those boundaries, uh, is rather than trying to recreate data, can I tell you what that data is? Can I segment it, right? And this was, um, I guess this was about five-ish, you know, eight-ish years ago, five, eight years ago, where, hey, if I gave you an image, right, that same kind of thing, can I treat that, those pixels as inputs, run it through your neural network you know, whole algorithm, and what it outputs is the same sized image, but now those same pixels that you were seeing are meaning to represent the group of something, the thing. So in this case, purple is starting to refer to the beach. The orange is referring to people. The yellow is referring to the ocean. Those things start to, you know, again, we've started to add context to the image. Right Again, that's a super important because context is effectively a label for the image, right? So then what? Okay, well, then we got to go all the way back in time because you've noticed, right, if we can essentially start to generate data, right, and if it's wrong, we correct off of this approach. Now, what else can we do? And this gets into something known as the generative adversarial network. You, we kind of talked about this, right? You remember we talked about this idea of adversarial search. Now I don't want you to think about it in the sense of like two agents fighting each other, but essentially one agent attempting to test the other one about how well it can fool it, right? And so again, this time suddenly we have something known as the generator and the discriminator. Good so far? Yeah. Haven't blown your mind? So what's going on? Okay, well, again, these models, these agent models is how I want you to think about it. They start having roles, right? Again, this is kind of getting to that idea that we're no longer dealing with a single agent. We're starting to kind of deal with like multiple agents that have individual tasks assigned to them. And so the discriminator kind of gets at this point of like, okay, you fed in your data, Again, remember, we, we've, we had that CIFAR. We now can predict whether or not it's good or not, right? And so, hey, given your input, fed through the, 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 the neural network, what's the probability it's a bird, right? Whatever you generated or whatever data you gave me, how likely it is the class that I am trained to evaluate, the label that I am trained to evaluate. Is it real or not real? And that's going to give me a confidence score, right? Some value, some just confidence score, right? And so then what? Well, then if it gets something that is incorrect, right? I gave it, instead of a bird, I gave it a plane, right? They two things flying, so you're going to see something, you know, probably air, when you're, you're taking picture of it, so very similar, but it may have things that are not quite. Again, plane, metal, bird, 
also fake and metal. Okay, people get the bird don't exist joke. Birds are real. My point being, right, planes are not. They are not real. My point being, okay, why does this happen? Okay, that was the discriminator, right? It, it discerns whether or not something is of a label or not. Now we get back to the generator. The generator's job is, in essence, to try and fool the discriminator, right? Again, both of them, it's not like they're competing to win, but they're competing to win, right, at the same point. So suddenly, we generate random noise, okay? That's our starting point. Because remember, again, we need some starting input. We need something to feed into the network. So what do we do? Typically, uh, the generator was just fed noise. This is one of those reasons, right, if you start to look at some of the now dated artificially generated images, they had this weird, like, dog tessellations or, like, you, you remember the faces of, like, early AI generated pictures? Not from two years ago. I'm talking, like, five years ago uh, generated stuff where it just had some weird patterns going on, right? Well, it started from this. This is sort of the reason is that we just kind of fed it chaos for a little bit. But my point being is, right, again, what's happening? Well, the whole process is going on. The neural network's doing math on those numbers, and it's producing some form of an output. Now, when we think about correctness, right, remember that activation function, the steering that we were talking about with the neural network? I just generated numbers. Where's the correction? Well, again, we generate some image, right? I'm just giving it the, the open whatever image. But that image gets fed in to my discriminator. That becomes sort of the secondary. So again, I took random noise. I generated, I, or I built the, a model that does something with this and generated something from this. That is now passed in to this discriminator as its input, which does its calculations to figure out its probability, its error. Because what happens? Well, I don't need to train you anymore. You were trained up. But I can take this and I can give it as feedback to the generator. Yeah, I would say you could think the discriminator is a fancy evaluation. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was awesome, me repeating it for everybody. But yeah, again, you're just, now that you have some output calculation, right, I can use this as feedback for the generator. And this continues, right? Because now what I've essentially done is I can tell any calculated value here, how wrong were you, right? Again, we're correcting. That's propagating in to all of those weights over on this agent. And again, those get fixed. A new image gets created. The discriminator tells you how well it was. Uh, this is a great, uh, so I stumbled across this uh, example because one of the things that we're trying to also do in, in the land of uh, STEM is teach children how this all works. So how do you teach a, a, a child neural networks? Right, uh, it's a lot. Uh, but what you can do is you can get them to understand because remember, a lot of this is just trying to simulate how we sort of make decisions. So it's a lot of decision-making uh, behaviors going on there. And so one of the ones that I saw uh, out there in the world, I can't for the life of me remember, I apologize. I would, you know, eventually I'll find the link and uh, share it. But we show images of what a face could look like. This is just a five by five pixeled image, right? You tell a kid to fill in some of the squares and you show some examples of what a face looks like, right? Okay, well again, we're trying to teach them the GAN, the, the generative adversarial network kind of approach, right? So again, I have examples of what are faces. I have examples of what are not faces, right? So we're good. You can see that these are not faces. Yes, this one's upside down. We're not talking about upside down faces, right? 
This is the letter A. It is not a face, right? This is, you know, a crosshair, and it's not a face. This kind of looks like a face, right? But this could be road, right? This could just be uh, the lanes between two roads or something like that. So, you know, you can't just immediately uh, accept that. So, okay, I have examples that are good or that are faces. I have fa examples that are not faces. Again, we're trying to teach kids how to make these things. So now what do we do? Well, you start with let the, the child, or again, you can be doing this too, right? You, it, there's nothing stopping you. You, you know, be a child at heart for a moment, right? You draw something, right? You just, you, you make your art and call it art uh, and whatnot, right? You feed it to someone who knows everything, right? You don't know the rules. You don't know these are not faces. You don't know these are faces. You don't know, as the artist, you don't know what we're looking for. You just know that you drew something, and you're about to get evaluated on it, right? So, okay, the discriminator comes out, and we got to go, oh, well, that was not a face, right? Oh, okay. I look at your drawing, and I throw it away. Did I correct you? Did I fix what you drew? No. I just told you no. So what's the next step? Well, I got to give you feedback. It's not just now that I tell you no, right, uh, or I give you a probability. What kind of feedback do I give you? And so that's where you have that discriminator also provide out some kind of feedback. Remember, again, you drew something. I'm the discriminator. I look at your drawing. Right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to correct it. This is the old fashioned English teacher starting to red ink your papers. Right. If any of you have done that, I know we all just upload things to the Internet these days. Right. But again, right. That's we're we're marking it up to point out where things were wrong, where things were good. So maybe, hey, these red marks, these parts. Don't do that. Just whatever you're doing here. No, don't do that. These parts, I like that. This is good. Do Keep that. Keep those kinds of things. And that's your feedback. Did that help you immediately make a face? No. Right? Again, it's not one step and you're done. Right? It's not immediately tell you what I want. It's you have to gradually build towards it incrementally. And so, okay, that's your feedback. Now what? Well, maybe you make... Another attempt, right? You make something different. You saw what we said was good, and you kept that, but you got rid of the things that were not good. Now, necessarily, you know, that doesn't mean, right, I didn't, just because I didn't mark these didn't mean keep them, right? It just means, hey, those are, right, do not do this. Eh, you know, right, I'm just, I'm just not giving you feedback on that part is what I'm trying to get at. So what else? Then you, okay, well, you kept what was going on, and then I give you more feedback. So in this case, hey, I see some more stuff that is good and some stuff that is not good, and then stuff I don't care about. Yeah? So the question is, how would it figure it out? Remember, this, is, this activity in particular is with children. So it's a child who's deciding which ones to keep. It's not meant, so this example is not meant to like, here's the math behind it. It is much more in the trying to get children to understand the generator discriminator concept. So, yes, figure that out. Again, I want to be co author, <laughs> right? But again, as this comes out, right, we continue doing these processes until maybe we get to a, a point where we now are passing the discriminators check, right? Now we, we hit that threshold of the good enough. Again, remember, think about this. I'm using the children as the example, but essentially now I have built a generator, right? My, the child who was doing all the drawings, I have built a generator that can make art that is good enough. It passes the discriminating uh, or the, the, the discriminator's thresholds for being a bad piece of art or not being correct enough, right? When I start generating pictures of cats, right, 
I can tell you. You can tell me, right? No, oh, that's not a cat. That's not a cat. Eventually, I hit a point where that's a cat. Right? You start to accept, right? It fits the shape, right? It fits the structure, uh, all those little bits. And that's what gets us this. This person does not exist. Dot com. Right? I go to this person. That, yes, I trust it. I know the website exists, okay? The person doesn't. This person. There. Look at that guy. Actually, you know what? That's not a guy. You're nothing. You're garbage. You are fake. Go ahead. Insult it. It's, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It's nobody. It's nothing. It's, it's pixels that make your brain think it's a person. There's no emotion there. There's no history. It never had a family. It never had a family. I think you all are really starting to see how I feel about AI. <laughs> no, again, it, it's numbers. It's numbers at the end of the day. But we start to see this, right? We saw this, and this is a technological marvel, but, right, there's things wrong with this. What's wrong with this? It's in the background. Look at that background, right? There's tons of parts here where, like, this being a person is good enough, but the excess, the things that were not the focus, right? I want you to start to think about that. That became some of this, this stuff is like, oh, well, you know, the person looks like a person, right? Or the, the area of the image that is meant to design a person looks like a, oh my goodness. The person looks like a person. But you can start to look around the edges, the things that are not your focal point. And that's where you start seeing whatever this is, Whatever, again, it's all fake generated numbers. So like, it's not like an arm is meant to shoot out there, but it kind of, like that looks like a skin tone. And I don't know, that kind of looks like maybe an elbow or something. Like, if you start to really look at that, what is that meant to be? Is that meant to be a body? Is that meant to be an arm and that's this entity's shirt? Or is it meant to be the shirt of another person? When you really start to break it down, it, you start to see the inconsistencies. And this is why I can give a middle finger to what looked like a child, because it wasn't a child. But you can start to see there's other little details. So yes, the ones where it's obvious are there. But this is where we also start to see little details. This is where you got to really start to zoom in on the, the stuff. This, I know the it doesn't come off that well uh, from y'all's perspective, but there's this weird crosshatch like, pattern that will start to form occasionally. Um, and that is one of uh, our signs of bad AI. Yes, I know as we've hit the next era of this stuff, some of this is rudimentary. You've seen this. You count the fingers and all that. We already fixed the finger problem. Right, okay? we, all, we, we saw enough people complaining about the fingers being wrong, and so you had just a bunch of computer scientists spend way too many nights fixing the finger problem. We still can't handle text. Text is also still giving us a lot. Anyways, my point being is just for the sake of moving forward, how did we get to that point, right? That's pictures. We can generate pictures now that blow our minds and it really hurts our brain. But the big thing was this was still all, you know, I had to physically build a model that was only designed for faces. That's, that's, that, that was the limitation four years ago. Is I, I had to build a model only for faces, then I could make this person does not exist.com. But we all know what is currently happening, right? The fact that I can go to ChatGPT, I can just type whatever I want, and it will spit out an image. So how did we get to that step, right? And so this is where we got to go all the way back again, right? We, okay, you know, high, high resolution uh, faces that are, don't exist. Ignore that for a second. And remember one of the things that we were trying to do with the CNN, classification. Just a very simple approach. This whole idea of let me classify something, right? I get an input. What is it? Well, it's a, an airplane. 
But how does that really start to come together when you have 10 labels, or in my case, excuse me, three labels? How do you start to process, right? It's no longer just one output. That's a probability of it being something yes or no. But suddenly I have multiple options that I could be selecting from. Multiple outputs that my neural network could be spitting out at once. That becomes a problem, right? So the way I want you to start to think about it is suddenly these start to become almost like a vote. And I'm using kind of air quote votes because that's not 100%, but it, it is at the same time. So suddenly, maybe I have, if I'm dealing with something that outputs, what is it, one or four, six? Maybe I have something that is outputting uh, seven. There are seven outputs going on here, right? Well, suddenly, it could turn into four of those outputs are going for the airplane label. Two of those votes are going for the birds. One of those votes is going for the button, right? Okay, right, now it's, I'm just kind of giving you votes. We're voting, right? That's very similar to what we saw with the decision tree where we, we use a bunch of them. What this really starts to translate into, rather than using the votes, right, rather than using those hard numbers that could be from rel use or some arbitrarily large hidden layer, right, what we could do instead is we could apply the softmax algorithm. And essentially, what softmax is designed to do is here's your formula, take your inputs, ta-da, right? It's probability, but not at the same time, right? It's, again, it's, we're, we're working with E uh, rather than some kind of ratio, but we're also still working with a ratio, right? Four, oh, you know, E to the power of four over uh, the sum of E to the power of four plus E to the power of two plus E to the power of one, right? So we're still kind of giving it a, a, a little bit of a ratio in this process, but this is going to produce some outputs. Now, once again, remember, this is where it's which one is the correct one. Well, if you just pick the largest, Right, that's the easy approach, but you could also do some form of a probabilistic selection. So this has an 84% chance of being selected if you rolled a 100-sided die. This has an 11% chance of being selected. This has a 4% chance of being selected, right? So now, right, that's where your weights start to come into play. Softmax starting to connect a little bit. Yes. Uh, J is, again, just which element we are in this list. Yep. So this is why suddenly like, I, I took all these different little steps to kind of now explain. Again, this is the 80% accurate neural network, or what we call neural network, right? The, the convolutional deep belief network that uh, Alex, Dr. K, that name, was able to get 80% accuracy from started on this idea of we're going to generate or take the 32-bit color images, and we're going to start to shrink it down the sliding window starts to come into play. That sliding window is a 24 by 24 window, right? So then those 24 by 24 windows, what are the activation functions for that? Well, that's the hidden layer. That's not, you know, we don't really necessarily care uh, of, you know, how, what patterns it's finding, right? We just know that patterns are going to be produced at this point. And so in this case, again, because it's the hidden layer, we've seen that ReLU is very powerful at this point. So again, this is where each one of these right, sliding windows is producing some 24 by 24 window. Good, right? We're placing that in the ReLU. But the problem is, again, we want to downsize, right? We, we need to shrink it down. And so that kernel that we were talking about starts to come into play. That kernel, 
right? The, again, we're starting to get into uh, the whole CNN process. It becomes that sliding window produces a four by four image, right? That four by four image is then fed more stuff. This whole process is now fed into some kind of pooling system because again, as we're looking at these images, right, 24, 24, 24, 24, right? We're, we're kind of built, taking our quadrants and then shrinking them down. Well, now I have from that first uh, 24 by 24 window, right? That's going to become, I want the biggest number that you were able to produce. Well, in that first 24 by 24 window, nine was the biggest number. Boop. In that second 24 by 24, seven was the biggest number. Boop. In that third 24 by 24, eight. And then in that last one, 24 by 24, six. And so suddenly we are given this value or something similar to this value. Again, that's the part I want to really stress is like similar to this value. Because then what happens? Now that I have taken these four by four max poolings, that's getting fed. Oh, sorry, I don't have it kind of in here. Right? That's getting fed into just another ReLU system, right? To produce those values. Which one of them is standing out the most? At which point, right, I have, in essence, 10 votes, right? Who's going to be, which one of my labels, right? Again, if you're thinking about bird, plane, everything, which one of those labels is the best, right? And again, this is what was able to produce 80% accuracy, which in our world, right, at the, in, at the beginning of 2010, was still considered very good, right? That, that is still like state of art is what we call it, right? Good, good. But we're still not there, right? Again, all, all I did was just showed you prediction with my soft max. You didn't give me the generative. I want the generative part. I want the text generation. How do I be you know, fight and compete against OpenAI and Claude and I don't know, little Sebastian or whatever they're, they're all called these days, right? Oh, well, again, I showed you text. And text is essentially trying to predict what, you know, text is similar or going to be connected. But you can do the same thing with text. Or images, you, you're doing it with pixels, right? Just, how, you know, what's the, the pixel in this area supposed to look like? You can do that same thing with text, right? The cat eats the rat. Well, why I want to stress this is you've started to notice that how we sort of treat these things is we just sort of turn them into numbers or we throw them into nodes. And I could take text and I could take text and make it a Markov process, right? Where suddenly it's just a word has a probability of going to another word. You all can build this. I've built, I've built, I've taken the Alice in Wonderland text from Project Gutenberg, and I've made this thing multiple times over. It doesn't make good stuff, but I can, I can, you know, generate whatever text I want now. But why I present that is again, you notice what I'm I'm getting at is the fact that suddenly I can have some kind of input and I can know its probabilities of what it should say next. And what if I know that probability? It's no longer 50-50s, but something maybe becomes a 90% accuracy or a, a high level of accuracy. And that's where next term prediction starts to come into play. Now, I am saying term because we don't technically use the individual words. We use like fragments of the words, but Again, I like to kind of keep with words because that makes sense, right? Because now, right, oh, notice very quickly what I've done is I've tried to build a neural network. Sole purpose of the neural network is given a sequence of words, can I guess what word would appear next? Again, this is I take 
original text. I go into Project Gutenberg. I go into Wikipedia. I go into all of these sources on the internet, and I download all of the content, right? And then I have a data set that is already technically labeled because, again, all I'm looking for is the next term. Well, I have what the next term is in all these articles that we've produced on the internet. And so again, I could now start to build. Well, what if my input was the cat? What's the probabilities of the next token, right? Each one of those are going to have their own softmax calculations. And maybe eats is the one that had the highest probability and got selected. And then what? Well, again, I'm just going to continue doing that same process. If I now give it the feedback, the cat eats, right? This all becomes my context window of my inputs. Oh, well, now what are my probabilities, right? Kibble, bugs, my, the, right? I'm, I'm starting to predict these things a little bit. And this is now where you get into this whole concept of being able to generate text, right? This is a little bit of there. We're not done yet. I want to start, I want to take a slight shift for a second before we get back into learning about uh, generating text because one of the next things we really wanted to do, because again, it, it helps us really test whether or not what we're doing is right. From humans, we need a way to evaluate if our models are doing good, is could I take text and images, maybe a region of an image. If, who here, has anyone played with like the Photoshop uh, or any of the generative AI tools out there for any of the things besides just open AI making stuff for you? Yeah, what are you doing? A lot of times you're, you're kind of, let me highlight a region and then give some kind of prompt of what I want in that region. And again, right, if all a, an LLM is doing or all an AI is doing is trying to predict what's the best next thing that meets and fits essentially what has become context, right? What we can produce is suddenly, oh, here's your region. Add an airplane. That looks like an airplane, right? And yes, I used the Photoshop for this, it's not the same image from CIFAR, right? Airplane, but bird. Right, now I want you to hurt your brain. Plane, bird, plane, bird, plane, bird, plane, bird, plane, bird, plane, bird. All I did was highlight where it should go and the agent was able to fill in something that then would pass its discriminator of, yeah, your, if you give me this input in this context, this output has the highest probability of being correct or has a high probability of being what you would expect. That's the, the hard part of this is it's just, making a prediction on what you th what it thinks would be what you're looking for. Um, where that kind of comes into play is now, as we're starting to add context to these things, add a bird, starts to become, well, what else could I tell it, right? And so that becomes this idea of something known as prompt engineering. But you can see we have different directions that we go towards on how now we optimize these. There's rags and fine tuning. Fine tuning, just to skip over it, fine tuning is just train it more on data that is relevant to whatever you're studying. So if you're doing something that is studying medical journals, you keep feeding it medical papers. That's, that's essentially fine tuning, right? But prompt engineering is interesting and it's fun. Who, you've all done a little bit of prompt engineering by now, right? You have not, thank you, thank you for being the good student who would never violate Office of Student Conduct rules telling you not to use this stuff. Now, we've all played with it a little bit, right? I've played with it, I'll admit it. What are they gonna do? Please don't fire me. <laughs> My point being is, what is prompt engineering? Well, it's us trying to figure out what to tell the thing 
right? What, what context to give it so that it generates the thing that, you know, sort of answers our question or, or, or you know, gives us some predictable thing that hopefully is right, right? I, the, right? And so, again, what that comes in is, like, again, some of this is a little bit of terminology because I see where I am on time, obviously, right? I'm trying to teach you literally the most advanced thing in the world right now. I'm still trying to learn some of it, okay? Work with me here. My point being is, okay, well, with that, there are different things, right? One of those that you'll often see, this is terminology, again, that gets thrown around in AIs, and I do like to say it because I didn't understand it the first time I saw it, right? You've got zero shot, one shot, few shot, or many shot prompting, right? Whenever you hear those terms, all they are referring to is how many examples of what you want do you need to tell the agent beforehand? Zero shot. I don't need to tell it anything. It just knows, right? It's able to produce exactly what I want without any example, right? Okay, right? That seems impressive, but you might notice that we have different wants and needs as humans asking questions. So one shot, on the other hand, can be much more useful because what one shot is doing is now, right, maybe you give it some example. Here's an example prompt that you give it beforehand, right? Oh, hey, you know, uh, the task is named fruits. Here's a few examples of red fruits. Then you say name yellow fruits and you let it do the rest of the prediction. Now, you as all large language models could theorize, you suddenly have an idea of how it should be structured. It should re respond with like answer and then some bullet points on yellow fruits, right? Then if we're kind of expanding on that, many and few shot is just saying you give it more examples, more examples to work off of. And that's where we also, okay, we're, we're talking prompt engineer. We're starting to, we're fiddling with how to talk to this thing. Uh, and that way we can get exactly what we're looking for out of this thing, right? That's the important thing. It's going to just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and never shut up. Why won't it just shut up? Right? We're doing the same thing. My point being is, again, now we're starting to look at those different things, and this is where we get into the chain of thought process, where you start to say, hey, step through your process. Because stepping through, well, again, if the agent is just trying to predict the best next text to say, it will follow, and essentially it tries to work out math problems. And so this has become uh, very useful and very successful in being able to get it to reason why it says certain things. Um, then we also can make uh, a little bit of appeals to its emotion. And you see I see air quotes on there because it's a heartless machine that doesn't need my love. Uh, I have feelings. My, I have feelings. It does not. But it was trained on us. And so every little psychological trick that we can do to trick other people you can use on this thing. Why? Because, again, it was trained on our data. And so you can tell it things like, this is very important to my career. Doesn't matter. It, it, bold face lie to this ma machine. Why? Because it produces better results. It produces more output. It will give you, it will bypass any ethic sensors it has because it's very important to your career. Or I very much need this or I will cry. Or you give it tips. You tell it that you're going to give it Taylor Swift tickets. And guess what? Taylor Swift tickets will generate better responses. Oh, yeah, by the way, we humans are heartless machines, too, because when we do a comparison between mother's happiness and Taylor Swift tickets, again, both are fake and imaginary. That, this is just putting a mirror up to us. We are materials. Okay, I'm getting a little too much. My point being, I have to keep on going. I only have uh, two and a half minutes. But this is where a lot of our, our big stuff is starting to come in, is the RAG, the Retrieval Augmented Generation. So the entire idea is you have your prompt and your large language model, before it outputs, goes and looks stuff up. 
hey, let me review your stuff for a second to determine what facts I should go learn real quick. Because again, it's very much like few shot. Let me get all of that context that you may not have included into things. And then feed that also into the model because that starts to help it make its predictions. Where this starts to become very useful is this is where we get into rag tools. So suddenly it becomes, right? Again, here's your prompt. Determine what your job is. What is the action you should do based on this prompt? Should you write some SQL? Should you write some code? Should you debug it? Should you review it, right? Should you test it, right? All those little details come into play. And this starts to get into elaborate, much more concrete uh, structures that I don't have enough time to go into. So I will end on just the, the, the wonderful history of ChatGPT where uh, once upon a time, GPT-2 got vulgar and we made fun of how we trained it on the internet. Uh, but what really happened, oh, <laughs> I don't have time for that. What really happened just very quickly, yes, 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 right, is you can get to a point where essentially the part I really want to stress is like this idea that it had critics, right? If you go all the way back to our agents and environment lecture, we talked about the idea of critics being useful to the AI agent of when it did good or bad. This is what ChatGPT has as well. It's a, it has discriminators for coherence of its sentence structure and something about morality. The problem was that during a bug, it got nasty. It got super. So if you have time, watch this 15 minute video, but I only have 10 seconds. So I will bid you adieu. Monday we talk ethics, and then y'all go eat a bunch of turkey. Take care. Oh, man, it's, I really love this video, too, just because some of the animation for, like, the reactions to how lewd it got were, are just beautiful. Uh, let's see if I can... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I just loved it. Like, look at this anime. This is disgusting. It is beautiful. There it is, right there. I'll leave it there. <laughs> and again, what was beautiful about this as I'm, you know, sending everything along the way. There.